Scott Ramirez, your host of Stand Out and Grow. I want to help your business stand out, survive, succeed, and grow. Building your business is really, really hard. And knowing what marketing and advertising tools you need to help you become successful is extremely confusing. After 30 years of working with thousands of businesses, I am here to help you make good business decisions. I want to help you understand the programs that are available to you so that you can stand out, survive, succeed, and grow. So let's get started. Hey, this is Kat, and this is my episode of Stand Out and Grow. And today I have a really special guest that I want to bring uh, on live and have you meet. And so um, Brian Ahern is the Chief Influence Officer at Influence People. And today we are going to talk about how you can close a sale successfully. So I'm so excited to bring Brian on. And hey, Brian. Hello. Great to see you, Kat. Great to see you too. I'm so glad to have you. And I think I mentioned to you when we talked about doing a podcast together that anytime I have a podcast, whether it's live or pre-recorded or recorded or whatever, um, that it's the biggest views of ever that I get the the most downloads and the biggest views uh, are typically on anything related to selling and how to close. So you got it. <laughs> yeah, it makes it makes sense. That's the the biggest challenge that salespeople have is closing the deal. That's right. And so um, let me just um, g- uh, give a little preface of how we met. So I met you at the IBBA um, conference and uh, in Denver, and um, you did the keynote speaking there. And so the group of people were business brokers um, coming together and sharing and collaborating, which was a great event. And your keynote was amazing and awesome. And it was uh, in reference to, again, influencing people in a positive way to get what you want at, and, you know, at the end. And so give us a little background about who you are. And so everybody that's going to join me understands who you are and what are you doing? All right. Well, I know me pretty well, so I can do that. Um, <laughs> I spent the vast majority of my career from the time I got out of college until almost four years ago in the insurance industry had roles in underwriting, um, commercial lines, personal lines, underwriting, corporate training, corporate sales. And about 20 years ago, I came across the work of a man named Dr. Robert Cialdini, who is the most cited living social psychologist on the planet when it comes to the science of influence. He is a social psychologist who worked out of Arizona State University. And when they came across his work, Kat, the light bulb came on. I mean, immediately I recognize, first and foremost, the psychology that he talks about is the underpinning of all selling. It explains why certain approaches work and why certain approaches don't. I also love the fact that it was all research-based. So this wasn't somebody giving their best advice. This was backed by empirical data. In fact, more than seven decades of data now. And the third thing I loved was his stance on ethics. He was very clear about non-manipulative ways to influence people. And so I began to use his work in the sales training I was doing and then developing sales coaching and running a corporate university. But the whole time I was doing that, I was building my business, influence people on the side because I knew it's what I wanted to do with the rest of my career. And about four years ago, I stepped away from the corporate role. And this is what I do full time speaking, training, coaching, consulting and writing around influence and the application in everyday lives. Okay, and so. Um, Because we kind of talked about this because your background is very strong in insurance. But regardless, the tactics, the methodology, all of this is for anyone, right? It's totally for anyone who's trying to sell something. Absolutely. It's it's for anyone trying to sell anything, but it's for anybody, period. Because like I like to tell people from womb to tomb, from the moment that we come into this world as an infant until the day that we leave, we are trying to influence people 
to get our needs met. And obviously a baby can't speak, so it cries to get attention. And mom and dad have to figure out, do we burp the baby, feed the baby, change the baby? And then as we get older, we learn how to communicate and we're still always trying to influence people to get our needs met. The challenge though, Kat, is most people don't know what the science says. So it's very hit or miss. And what I try to do is teach them what the science is so they can be more thoughtful and strategic and enjoy more success as a result. Okay, so let's let's get into some nitty gritty. And so my first question to you is because you do this a lot and you do. If anybody is watching right now, uh, definitely check out Brian. I'll throw it down his uh, website link below. But you speak across the whole U.S. and is it the world too or just? I, yeah, I've done some international work and uh, knock on wood, if the pandemic keeps dying down, I hope to do a lot more. Okay. Okay. So um, what is the number one, the biggest challenge that you hear repetitively from people that you're speaking to or want more information? What's the number one challenge? Well, I work mostly with salespeople. So the number one thing that people ask is what's the best way to close the deal? And my typical response is the um, best way to close the deal. The first time you meet somebody, look them in the eye and shake their hand because everything builds from there. It's like the foundation of a house. If the foundation isn't strong, then it doesn't matter because the rest of the house is going to be unstable. Okay, so I love this and I love us getting into this because this is going to get into uh, a lot of conversations. I run into a lot of people because as my company, we do business development, we do marketing, we do things to help people drive leads, right? Drive leads to them, okay? The thing that I come across a lot is people want instant gratification and they think they can sell the product by email or do you know what I'm saying? By messaging and by, and, and it's really hard for people to understand that there's a process, there's more to it than that. Yeah. So it, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Sure. I think, I think our culture, especially over the last 20 years, because of technology, we are living in an instant gratification world, right? We order something on Amazon and it's there the next day. And so we assume no matter what we're doing, that we're going to get that same type of response. And, and depending on the product or service you're selling, there can be a long lead time. There can be years in, in the sales cycle for certain products or services. So people have to, to recognize that just because we can order something, for example, or we can get the instant gratification of watching anything on Amazon or Netflix, it doesn't work that way when we're actually interacting with people in a, in a sale. And so we have to then be able to step back and ask ourselves, what's the most effective way for me to communicate? And there are ways to be more effective so that maybe you can shorten that lead time. Maybe you can move from prospecting to first meeting sooner. And so ultimately you're shortening the cycle, but that usually comes with understanding how people think and behave and then being willing to adjust how you communicate with them to make it cognitively easier for them to go. That makes sense. That's a yes. And keep moving on in the sales process. Right. Now, I know there's a big difference between product base and service base. Okay. Um, because again, when we talk about like buying on Amazon and things, if you show me the product, I'm probably going to price shop, right? I'm going to do some things and, and I don't need to talk to someone. Right. But when we go to service base and then we go to big ticket item, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes it doesn't even have to be big ticket item. Do, is there a need to meet with that person is there an, is, is should that be part of the process and what i'm referencing is like let's say that this abc company has a ten thousand dollar ticket item right mm -hmm. like shouldn't there be a process in place so that there is some touch points and you can't assume that that ten thousand dollar ticket is going to be bought in that first or you're going to find out if they need that ten thousand dollar ticket in the first like engagement or encounter? Absolutely. I think um, the more expensive something is, the more risk someone has on the line because they don't want to spend $10,000 or more on a product or service that ultimately fails. 
And then also the more complicated, the product or service. I think both of those necessitate having a good salesperson. But a good salesperson isn't somebody who's going to just regurgitate what you can learn online. They're going to be able to bring up uh, features and benefits. They're going to be able to talk about them in a compelling way. And I will reference insurance as an example. I know that we can see commercials and say, you know, go online and say 15 minutes or say 15% in 15 minutes or less. Um, personal homeowner and auto products are very homogeneous. Yep. But more expensive your home and the more expensive your cars, you are going to want somebody to make sure that you are properly covered because you don't want to go try to save 15% and then realize that you're paying tens of thousand dollars out of pocket because you weren't properly covered. And that's where I think a good salesperson comes in who can alert you to things that as a buying public, you're probably not going to know or understand. And that hopefully that person goes, thank you. You know, if I hadn't reached out to you, I would probably be making a poor decision because I thought I knew what I was doing. But the reality is I'm not an expert at that. Yes. Yes. So th there is a theory because I've been through a lot of sales training. There are some theories in that if you educate people, you eventually will convert those people because you've gained trust and respect. If you um, if you treat people with the respect that you would treat yourself, right? And how you do a buying decision. Once again, you're going to earn and gain that respect and trust. Um, in, my, in my experience, I feel like people buy me because they trust me. Mm -hmm. They are not necessarily buying my product or service because it's a number one or it's the best of the best, right? They're buying it because they have this trust and uh, and sometimes people are very clear about it. They're saying, wow, Kat, I really like that you're transparent and you really just, you know, lay it on the line, you know, and just call it for what it is, you know. And I would think that a lot of your training and theory has to do with that relationship building, right? The relationship building of earning and gaining that trust. Absolutely. Uh, again, I think it's the foundation. And when we talk about building a relationship, there's one principle in particular that I try to get people to focus on, and it's called liking. Now, everybody who's watching or listening is going to get this. Um, people prefer to say yes to those they know and like. Well, duh, right? We, again, we all understand that. But the problem that most people have, even when they know that, they spend all of their time trying to get the other person to like them. And that's not the way to go about doing it, because that will make you come across as a bad person used car salesperson or appliance salesperson who is transactional and just trying to buddy up to you for the moment, get you to like them and to buy. And I think most people are savvy enough now where the radar goes up and they, they kind of push back on that. But the real way that you employ this principle is you do everything you can to like the person you're with. So, Kat, if you were a potential customer, I'd be doing research about you online before we meet. I'd try to find out anything I could because I would recognize two things. First of all, if we have something in common, we are going to tend to like each other more. It's just natural for people to like others that they see as somewhat similar to themselves. And the second thing that I'm going to look for are things that I can genuinely compliment you about. Because when I compliment you, right, the endorphins are flowing, you feel good about me, and you naturally like me. But here's the key. When I'm finding things that we have in common or I'm paying you a genuine compliment, I'm convincing myself how much I like you because I see you as similar to me. And, of course, if I compliment you, I'm thinking more highly of you. And that's the game changer, because when you begin to sense, hey, Brian really likes me and really seems to care for me, and I do because I'm thoughtfully employing the psychology, that's what opens you up to whatever I might ask of you. And because I do get to know and like you, I am putting forth what I believe is in your best interest, and that's how you're receiving it. And this is what begins to inform the rest of the sales process. Yes. And I love that you said this because I can give you another example where I was pitching against, you know, I don't know, let's say five, 10 other people. And the person said, Kat, you ask the most questions than anybody else. And I feel like you really, really do care. 
And so it's genuine sincerity, right? It's being very genuine about and being authentic about who you are and what your motive is. Whereas the uh, people that tend to be a little more fake, it shows out, right? It just shows a little bit, you know? Well, I I like to say people have good BS meters. I mean, (laughs) we can take in with all of our senses. We we can see, we can hear, we can, uh, the smile, the tone of voice, all of those things are alerting us to the authenticity of somebody. And when we really believe that that other person likes us and cares for us, we begin to interact with them differently than the other person that we're not in those same vibe. And we're feeling like they're just out there to make a sale. Now, ultimately, at the end of the day, when your job is selling, yes, you do want to make a sale. But when the motivation behind it is, I want to get to know and like my customers, I want to do everything I can to help them, and they start buying, those are the people who become the repeat customer. Those are the people who refer you. Those are the people who, even if they have to say, Kat, you know what, I love you, but you're not right for me. And and they tell you why, and and legitimately, you may not be right for everybody, but they're probably the people who will refer others to you because of the experience that they had with you. Yes, I would agree. Okay, so we talked a little bit about how to build a better business relationship, right? So we kind of talked about some fundamentals there and and, you know if if someone wants to explore more dialogue in that we're going to tell you how to get a hold of brian after this um so let's now explore some ways on how do you or how do you coach people to deal with objections because objections to me to me objections are success because you got to have an objection to get a a, you know someone to say yes right you got to have a series of no's in order to get that yes right we can't always expect that we're going to fully inform somebody and not going to have questions or that whatever we share they're not going to understand the good news about objection there's two things first it does show that that person's engaged You know, if they just passively sit there and take it in and say, thank you very much, they're probably just disconnected. So when somebody is objecting, they're they're at least in the conversation and they're critically thinking about what you're sharing. But the second thing is, if you've been in sales, and in particular for your company or within your industry for any length of time, it's very seldom somebody is going to throw an objection at you that you have not heard before. So that means you've heard them before, you should practice. And Kat, when you saw me on stage at that conference in May, I had practiced every single day for a month going through that presentation. Now I've done it thousands of times in terms of practicing and then actual in front of audiences, but I don't want to become a slacker and just think, well, I got this thing. And so I put in that practice. And I always think if I'm going to do that, then why isn't a salesperson, you know, driving along from one customer to the next, thinking about the objection that they might face and verbally going through how they will deal with those objections? You never want to sound rote. You don't want to sound like a bad telemarketer or something, but you want to know it so well that it rolls off your tongue in a conversational way where that person can go, oh, wow, that really makes sense. They don't feel like they're being sold. They feel like they're engaging in a conversation. And that only happens when you can anticipate and you've practiced. Yep. Yep. And um, one of the tactics that I actually use for objections that are reoccurring that I know come up over and over and over is um, I really confront it in the conversation early in the conversation. So I knock it out, just yep. immediately knock it out because I, if I know that that objection will come up because of historical, you know, that it's always come up before, then uh, I usually you know, deal with it in getting as opposed to try to hide it or try to, you know, sweep it under the carpet or try to run from it. You know, um, I'm a big believer in like really just putting it out there. Yeah. Well, and, and what you're doing is you're engaging in, in this principle of authority. Principle of authority tells us that, that we will rely more on people that we see as trusted experts. Uh, you one of the ways you gain trust is by admitting weakness up front or maybe putting on the table um, a shortcoming in your product or service, something that you know someone might object to. And so for me, uh, if I were to say, you know, uh, Kat, you're probably looking at me and saying, wow, you look pretty young. How long have you been in the business? Now I know I'm not <laughs> young. 
but, but that's that's one of the ones that comes up all the time. You as a salesperson would not want to hold your breath and hope they're not going to ask that. Because if you go through this presentation and then at the end of the presentation, they say, by the way, how long have you been doing this? Oh, I've been on the job six months or something like that. Then everything gets deflated. So you want to address that up front. You want to be comfortable in, in how you're making that presentation. And that could be very different for people. Some people might still be able to, in a short time period, say, you know, I may look young, uh, but believe it or not, I've already got hundreds of customers just like you. Or uh, yes, I started six months ago, uh, but because I've learned this product inside now, uh, I've closed the last 10 sales where I've gone out and done presentations. There is going to be something that you can then put forth to say, even though I may look young or be inexperienced, Here's why you should choose me. But if you wait until they ask towards the end, you've lost credibility. So that's a, a great move, Kat. Always bring up what you know are going to be the likely objections. Yep. Yeah. And I also feel like that if someone, and then we're going to revert to your first point, okay, building that rapport. Mm -hmm. If someone can build a strong rapport, you can overcome any objection because you've gained that trust. And I don't think people understand that that is such a key factor in trying to overcome objections because there's some objections you're not going to overcome, right? They're, you're just not. Yes. I mean, no product or service is perfect. No individual is perfect. Everything has some kind of shortcoming or weakness. You know, a big thing, though, in sales is making sure that your product or service is aligned with the right people. Yep. Uh, so you're not trying to sell to everybody because your product or service won't meet their needs and it will look deficient to some people. But the more that you understand your product and service and can target it to the right people, those become less and less. And it becomes an easier sale because you understand them and they clearly see how what you're offering meets their needs. Yes, exactly. And I'm going to share this metaphor that I always use. And uh, I think you'll appreciate it, Brian. Uh, <laughs> this metaphor, I always, I when I train my team and I, I coach my team, uh, you know, and I coach them in customer service, okay, customer service and having good customer service and building that good rapport once they get a new account. So when they get a new account, they have a discovery call. In the discovery call, their job is to really earn that rapport and respect, right? To, to mm -hmm. build that and build that foundation. And you will always get a sense if you got it. You know, when you're laughing or giggling or someone makes, yep. you know, a comment or something, you can get a sense that you get that. So if you don't build that rapport and then you go your separate ways and you do the work, mm -hmm. When you make that first mistake, it stands out like a sore thumb. They'll point That's it out. Mean. They'll, they'll mm, squish on it, right? They'll make sure everybody knows because there is no connection, okay? Mm -hmm. And I've tested this. This is like, this is for real. It happens for real. If you build that rapport, okay? And it's kind of like dating, right? Like, if you have a blind date and you didn't like the person and then they uh, you went on a second blind date, anything they did, you're going to nitpick. You're going to be like, ah, you know, ah, nah, nah. whereas if you like the person, right, you went on a blind date, you like the person and they made a mistake, you're going to be like, oh, that's OK. That's just John. That's OK. And that's very much like business. Where if you built that rapport and you made a mistake, they're going to be like, it's okay, but hey, let's work on this. Let's see what we can do so that we don't make that mistake again. Would you agree in my little metaphor there? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I often tell audiences, people may not buy from you just because they like you, but they'll probably never buy from you if they don't like you. And so we've we've got to we've got to make sure. But the more somebody likes you, the more forgiveness there is for a lot of things. But the positive news, too, is if you make a mistake and you admit that and you bend over backwards to correct that, quite often people will actually look at you in a better light or rate your service even better. And that was borne out in a study that was done decades ago where people would go into a restaurant and if their order was perfect, if everything went the way that it was supposed to, they didn't rate the restaurant as high as people who had a problem. Wow. But the problem will resolve to their satisfaction. It engages a principle that we call reciprocity. When you see that that person is really working hard to make up, 
you tend to give a little more to that person or to that organization too. So even when we make a mistake, don't get down on it. Say, okay, how can I turn this into an opportunity? I absolutely agree. And so again, your your point, your first point gives so much value to the life of this relationship, you know. Okay, so let's talk about the final step kind of like in, if we talk about the sales process or strategy. It's uh how to how to close a sale successfully or just period how to close a sale. I think anybody could care less if it was successful. They closed it, they were like, "Yay!" Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so, so what are some of your tips on how to close this out? Okay. Well, the, there's a couple of psychological principles that really come in handy when you're trying to close a sale. And the first one is called commitment and consistency. That says that people feel this internal psychological pressure to be consistent in what they say and what they do. So as a salesperson, and you talked about how many questions you ask early on. So in the discovery process, or if you call it the qualification period, however you term that, you're not just trying to find out about the person, you're trying to find out what they believe, what they value, what they're looking for, uh, what criteria it's going to take for them to make a decision to move, because all of those can come back at the time of the close to be referenced. And so there's a term, and I'm sure that if people have been in sales for any length of time, they've heard the term upfront close. And it's basically trying to find out exactly the criteria that if you can do those things, that individual agrees that they will move their business to you. The more specific that you can get about that, then you can come back uh, as it's time to close. And I might say, you know, Kat, uh, early on when we talked and I was asking you why you were looking to make a change and you, and you told me some things, but you said the top three criteria that were going to be in making the change was A, B, and C. Well, we've done A, B, and C. In fact, I think we've done a little bit more. You can see we've added, and I begin to talk about what we've done. But when I clearly point out to you that you said we needed to do A, B, and C. It's hard for people to kind of wriggle out from under that. And I don't say that meaning that people want to back out, but at the time of a close, there's a little fear. Is this product or service going to be everything that I thought it was? Well, last time I made a change, it wasn't so great. That's why I'm making a change again. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of psychology that's kind of pulling people back. And then if it's expensive and all of that. And so we want to make it easier for that person to follow through on their commitment. But also, if we've done our job well and we know that the product or service that we sell is going to help them, then we need to get them to make that decision for their own best interest. And then the other piece of psychology that we talk about is called scarcity. Uh, we value things more when we think they're rare or going away. Rather than framing everything as, you know, look at all the benefits you're getting, A, B, and C, you know, you just slightly reframe it and you say, you know, Kat, um, we've been talking about this now for a while, and I really don't think it would be wise for you to give up A, B, and C. Right. I'm not touting this is what you're getting. I'm saying by you not making this decision, you're giving these up and it just reaches people viscerally. We hate the thought of losing or giving up something. Right. And so that slight reframe, not fear tactics, not yep. scaremongering or anything like that, but just showing this is where you give up if you don't make this decision or you keep kind of going along the lines that you're currently going. And that, too, becomes very compelling for people to say, okay, let's go ahead and, and make this a, a done deal. Right. So I would to concur with you. Like, the more uh, the sense of risk you remove from someone and give them that sense of that um, this is going to work out, give them that sense mm -hmm. of confidence, um, that helps. I know it helps in our situation where we get new clients um, and people can use different things to do that um, mm -hmm. when they are, and everybody has a different business model and different product or service or good that they're putting out there. Um, but to me, that uh, helps that person feel like you're in the game. I'm in the game. We're in it together, you know, and I, right. I feel like that is a strong position to put yourself in when you yes. do something like that, you know, and um, leverage that. One, I'll give one example because this always resonates so well. When I worked at the insurance company for about a decade, I ran the bonus plan. And insurance agents, depending on various metrics, they can earn a lot of extra money via bonus at the end of the year for writing a lot of business and doing it profitably. 
when people would go out, a typical sales rep might go to an agent. And if you were the agent, they might say, cat, I just looked at the sales numbers and you're so close to getting to president circle. And if you get there, you're going to earn an extra $50,000 this year. Now you will be motivated. You may not have been thinking about it. $50,000, a lot of money. But what the research says is the better approach would be cat. I was just looking at the sales numbers and you're so close to getting to president circle. And if you don't get there, you're going to lose $50,000 of your bonus. And you're probably going to go, what? Well, Kat, if you get there, you're going to earn $150,000. But if you miss President Circle, you're going to lose the kicker and you're going to not get that extra $50,000. And people will work so much harder to avoid losing what they sense is already theirs. And I'm framing it that way. And here's the good thing. When you get that bonus, you're not going to come back and go, well, darn you, Brian, for scaring me into getting that bonus. What am I going to do with the 50 G's? Right. You're going to say, thank you. I didn't realize what was on the line. Now, I can do this in an authentic way because going all the way back to the beginning of our discussion, I have come to know and like you and I want what's best for you. And so I'm going to talk in a way that I know science says will be most effective for you to make a decision that is ultimately in your best interest. Yes. And and you, well stated. That's very well stated. Um, and I feel like when I, again, when I'm talking to clients and I get them to uh, get off that cliff and, and convert, it, a lot of times it's I'm sharing that risk with them. I'm sharing mm-hmm. it. I'm saying, hey, we're going in this together and I got your back. Um, yeah. But you can't do that if you didn't do step one, build that rapport. And I'll Absolutely. tell you. Your that first statement that you made and that first step goes a long, long way. And I think a lot of people and those watching uh, don't understand that a relationship goes a long way. And the other thing, too, is if if you don't build that rapport, you're never going to know if they need your goods or service. Right. You're never going to know. And people don't want to be sold. People want you to solve their problems. You can't solve the problems if you never have that dialogue and build that rapport, right? Absolutely. You know, um, when it comes to the the rapport building and and the relationship to um, people lament that in the technology world that we're in now and texting and email and all of that stuff, that that it's going by the wayside. The good news for people like you and I and, and for those who are listening is when we do it well, it will stand out. And that will be the thing that the kind of customers that you're looking for who value that will flock to you and want to do business with you because they don't want to just be sending emails back and forth all the time. They want some human interaction. And so we can give that to them. Let's figure out how to do it to the best of our ability. Yes, I uh, absolutely 100% agree. So any advice for... And again, my audience, Brian, uh, is typically an independent contractor, solopreneur, or a small business owner, or or a small business with like, let's say 25 or less in their team. Like any advice to those types of people when they're looking at their sales, their numbers, and they're not happy, right? They're not happy. Any words of advice that you can give them? Well, I I think the emphasis that we've put on the principle of liking and building a relationship would be the the place to start. Because if you don't do that well, everything else that we've talked about, trying to engage commitment, consistency, or scarcity could come across as a manipulative tactic if that if that client or potential client doesn't really recognize that you like them and care for them and that you're getting their trust in in the process. So so that would have to be the foundation. Everything else would just be kind of a technique that may or may not work if you don't have the foundation in place. Yes, I absolutely agree. Okay, so uh, as we wrap this up, uh, how can anybody here uh, get a hold of you? Uh, you know, what what are the channels besides, I just dropped your uh, link in the in this little scroll bar. Well, um, the two best ways, my, my website, influencepeople.biz uh, and LinkedIn. I post a lot of content on LinkedIn. And so if anybody is listening or watching and says, this is interesting and I want to learn more, I, I think the best way to dip your toe in the water is to start connecting with me and then see the information that I'm putting out. Uh, I will guarantee you that if you send a request to connect and you don't tell me that you that uh, you heard me on the show with, with you, Kat, I will come back and say, how did you find me? 
I do that with every one of my LinkedIn. It makes it personal. We still have a little bit of interaction. Um, and what I will do, I'll make an offer to, to your uh, listeners and, and your viewers that if they reach out and say, I heard you on the show with Kat, I will send them a link to one of the LinkedIn learning videos where they have 24 hour access to take the course for free and learn a little bit more about influence. Oh, awesome. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I think one of your videos had like over 500,000 uh, people go through it, right? Yeah, my LinkedIn, That's I've got four courses on LinkedIn learning and, and the one that I will uh, share with people will be just talking about the sales process since they're salespeople. I'll send that link to them and, and you'll hear about the psychology we're talking about, but you'll see it's clear application starting from prospecting all the way through getting referrals. Oh, that's fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. And then if someone was wanting, what are the services you provide? Everybody wants to know what services you provide, right? So, so I, as I did when you were at the conference, I, I keynote a lot yep. of conferences where I kind of introduce the psychology that we're talking about. From there, it can morph into single or multi-day training. I do consulting. So sometimes an organization just says, hey, let's have conversation, share with you the process, tell us what we can be doing better. And then sometimes it's one-on-one -on -one coaching okay. where individuals say, I don't have time to go to a conference, but can we schedule time and, and you work with me in a one-on-one -on -one basis? Beyond that, I, I write, I've written three books on, on the topic. So speak, train, write, coach, consult. That's what I do. Okay, awesome. And where can they find your books? Are th those are on your website as well, or Amazon, where? Yeah, the, the books are on the website. When you click on them, you'll go over to Amazon, uh, get the Kindle version or paperback. My first book came out. I also did a um, an audio version of that, but I didn't for the second book because it's very sales focused. And okay. so you really need to sit down and kind of look at it and think about it. It's not just let me listen to this. Okay, I know it now. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. Good. Um, so putting some action into it. Uh, fantastic. Well, Brian, it was so great to have you on the show. I appreciate you. Well, I, I appreciate you having me on. It's always nice when someone recognizes me from a conference and it leads to something like this. So thank you for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, in all the uh, social links, I'll drop your link in the comments there. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to Brian, I will definitely help you get connected to him. Um, if you can't find him or get connected to him, reach out to me and I will certainly connect you. And uh, again, thank you, Brian. This was very, very helpful. I, I, as I said, mentioned before, I love anything sales related and your conversation and your keynote at that conference was amazing. And if, if, and I don't know, do you have a YouTube too? I didn't ask I you that. I have some videos out on YouTube. Most of the videos I've got links to from the website. So when people go there, you know, there's links to 150 plus podcasts, there's okay. videos, there's all kinds of stuff. Oh, fantastic. So you can get a little taste of what Brian speaks to, and mm -hmm. it is worth every ounce of your time to just tune in. Thank you again, Brian. I appreciate you. You're welcome. Have a good day. Thanks. Uh, so tune in next time. Uh, our next speaker uh, we have lined up for next Monday. So I will be back. I hope that you tune in and watch me then. And uh, make sure that you are dropping your comments in the links below and let me know where you're hearing from. And until next time, you got this. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Stand Out and Grow. Check out all the notes and links at www.standoutandgrow.com. I am so thankful to you for helping this show continue to grow. I want to keep producing content that you want to hear, so please leave me some feedback. I look forward to bringing you more resources and information to help your business stand out and grow. Please follow us on social media and make sure you follow this podcast so you can learn more about helping your business stand out, survive, succeed, and grow. Until next time, you got this. Advertise helps businesses stand out and grow with affordable advertising options. We will help you make good business decisions so you can save money. 
and not just throw it against the wall to see if it sticks. Get your free strategic advertising analysis today so you can see the opportunities to stand out and grow your business. Visit www.standoutandgrow.com offers page to learn more.